You are interested in the unusual, the mysterious, the unexplainable. That is why you are here. All right. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates on tonight's show. I have a very special guest, a returning guest. One of my favorite guests, his name is Ken Ami. He's written close to 30, if not over 30 books on a variety of subjects, very important, timely subjects. I think he's superb at detecting trends and things that really are, should be researched by anybody in these strange times. Our last interview was about uh, post-genderism and uh, that one went really great. But today we're going to talk about another of his books. The title is, Is Jesus the Messiah? A Judaism versus Judaism debate. So it's a, it's a very interesting topic um, coming from uh, Ken and he'll probably have to spend some time defining terms so people don't get a misunderstanding about what his positions are, etc. But uh, he does that. It's a very long book. Hopefully, we'll take two hours to do it. This will be the first hour. But Ken, are you there? Yes, sir. And I'm very glad to be back on with you and your audience. Awesome, man. Thanks so much for agreeing to this. This is a, a great subject. And you've written a book that includes the Old Testament, New Testament, and also post Christian or post messianic, if you will, Judaism as well. So I think that you really um, did some great research on this book. And maybe for people who haven't heard, there's probably not too many who haven't heard of your name. Can you uh, talk about your background, talk about how you got interested in the subject? Also, your website is truefreethinker.com. So uh, people can go there and look at uh, his posts. He's posting very frequently on current issues and current topics as well. But please, uh, if you could talk about your background. Sure. Uh, contextually, the portion of my background that's relevant to today's topic is that I am Jewish. And um, ever since the age of 27, I came to accept that Jesus is the Messiah. And so this research, this book, is one that's extremely close to my heart. And it really details uh, the research that I conducted really, I think some of the best books come about when an author says, hey, I want this for myself. I want to know something. And then the more we learn along the way, the more we decide we're going to write it down and share it. So that was what uh, happened with me is, oh, of course, it's a very long story. Like I said, it would take 27 years to, to get to the point. Um, <laughs> but this book, I th believe I finished writing it maybe 15 years ago. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll talk about a few things in terms of background. Okay. So let's just start with uh, after I accepted Jesus as Messiah. Um, through various trials and tribulations and growing up literally thinking that Christians were my enemies. And don't ask me why I thought that, because nobody ever told me anything like that. That's just what I thought. And never knowing Christians really until the age of 20, maybe 22 or 23 is the first time I met a person that I can say, okay, I know that person is a Christian. Although many years later, I did remember that my Hebrew teacher in public high school was a Baptist minister. Um, but I certainly had no idea what Baptist meant, and I'm sure I barely even knew what minister meant. <laughs> Except I knew he was a goy. I mean, he, I knew he was a Gentile. Um, and so, well, it was a very trying um, process going through uh, the stages of shock, really, when it came down to it, uh, from denial to thinking, who are these crazy Gentile Christians thinking that they can explain the Old Testament to me? You know, it was, who do they think they are? Uh, so denial and anger, and you know how it goes. Ultimately, it was acceptance. So now, um, after that, I ran across a book written by Chuck Smith and Mark Eastman, and it's called Search for Messiah, The Search for Messiah. And All right, so just picking up, Ken, maybe you can start um, with your education and how it progressed to learning about the Tanakh, as you uh, wrote about in your book, and how that kind of uh, 
came to your uh, reading of the New Testament and accepting of Christ? Well, one important thing is that, as far as my experience, Jewish people sit around talking about whether Jesus could really be the Messiah or not, about as much as Christians sit around talking about whether Muhammad could be the uh, final prophet or not. In other words, it doesn't really happen. <laughs> Uh, and so in my time during private, uh, attending private Jewish school or um, even in my two months that I was in Israel, I mean, I remember it coming up once that one person said one thing about Jesus and that's it. And he just said everything Jesus taught was Jewish except turn the other cheek. Uh, that Jesus, that everything he taught was Jewish is uh, expected because he's the Jewish Messiah but that the only thing that wasn't Jewish is turned the other cheek. That's not even true. So anyhow, uh, <laughs> gotcha. yeah, uh, you definitely have to kind of remove yourself from your environment as a Jew to end up um, seriously looking into something like this. And I mean, that, that sounds very easy um, when you have the internet at your disposal. But remember, this was back in the day. Right. So pre pre internet, and you said you came across a book that was very influential. Right. So I ended up considering myself oh so open minded, you know, and I, I really looked into many different religions and philosophies, and um, eventually realized that well, gosh, you know, I haven't given Christians a fair hearing. Uh, which is really typical of people who call themselves open-minded. They, they never really come to that conclusion. <laughs> but I did, so I started giving them a fair hearing. And again, I thought that they were just nuts, especially telling me what my own Jewish scriptures really meant. Okay, So then to the book, it was The Search for Messiah by Chuck Smith and Mark Eastman. And it wasn't so much what they wrote in the book that got my attention, but that they quoted a tremendous amount of rabbinic literature. And I could see the quotations, but I couldn't believe it. And I could see the citations, but I couldn't believe it. Because what they were demonstrating from the rabbinic literature is that we could very well, as good old-fashioned rabbinic Jews, and maybe I'll have to define the term rabbinic Jews in a minute, we could expect the Messiah that was just as Jesus is, or... And so that was really unbelievable to me. So that drove me to the re religious materials library at my local university, where I could really could get my hand on all these rabbinic texts. Again, it's a lot easier to do it online these days, but not, not back then. Back then, it was spending hours, literally hours, in the library, plowing through these um, rabbinic texts, looking things up, writing notes, and that, that's all that I began compiling into what eventually turned into this book. So it was my own research to satisfy my own curiosities. And the reason that I subtitled the book, A Judaism versus Judaism Debate, is because really before it becomes a Jewish versus Christian debate, um, Jews, rabbinic Jews, have to grapple with these things on their own, by themselves, between themselves, because it is their own literature that is saying that we can expect a Messiah to be like Jesus is. Right. So in other words, it's an in-house thing before it becomes uh, an issue you have to argue uh, between Jews and Christians. Gotcha. So, so yes, go ahead. Sorry, no, you continue, please. Yeah, so in a way, and, and I know that you'll understand this for the, from your background, okay? Uh, in a way, Catholicism and Judaism, Rabbinic Judaism, are very similar in, in many ways, including that uh, it's a cultural thing, right? It's a familial thing, right? I'm Absolutely. a Jew because, because my DNA is Jewish. I'm a Jew because my family's Jewish. I'm a Jew because my culture is Jewish. Same thing with Catholicism. Yes. Al although Judaism... It really means a couple things, including a people group and also a theology. 
Right. But in that sense, it is very similar. Right. So. Right. Well, I think I would say that there's not a lot of questioning within Catholicism, maybe similar within Judaism as, as far as is there another way? And you definitely, the, the priests and the rabbis right. may be co-equal in authority, you know? So uh, what I mean by that is that they're looked up to and, you know, th those are, you don't really question them too much on their opinions. Definitely. And, and again, in, in like a modern day first world country, that can be a little different because, hey, if you don't like the priest of this church, you just run off to the next one. And same with a synagogue or what Jews sometimes call temple. But uh, the bishops, the priests, the rabbis, they used to be community le leaders. They still are in, a, in certain senses. But yeah, it's very much the same. Right. <clears throat> so what, uh, you know, as you, as you kind of progress down this road, how did you, I mean, you still, you came into some definitional issues because... Are you, I mean, some P Jewish people would, if you become a Messianic Jew, you're no longer a Jew. Right. And uh, you know I have a whole chapter on that. <laughs> right. right. Well, so, I, mean, I think it's important to clarify the terms, especially right. before you get into biblical proofs. Right. So I'm emphasizing the term rabbinic Jew, Judaism. Because that's my background, okay? So in other words, if you look at Judaism today, it's obviously extremely different than the religion of the Old Testament, right? Mm -hmm. Old Testament that Jews call the Tanakh. And so that's why um, it's important to emphasize the term rabbinic Judaism because this is the, the religion that developed really out of necessity um, due to when the Hebrews or Israelites, right, the Jews, again, you have all these different terms, were dispersed, were removed from their land, taken to other nations. And okay, how can you still be loyal to God if you can't be at the temple or, uh, offering your sacrifices? How can you perform all these, how can you fulfill all these laws that require you to be in the land when you are kicked out of the land? And that's part of how rabbinic Judaism developed. And so it becomes more about um, the authority of the rabbis and the study of the rabbis and the laws of the rabbis. And also, it seems pretty clear to me, the influence that they picked up from Gentile pagan nations, such as being in Babylon. You'll, you'll run across a lot of really odd things like that as well. So that that's rabbinic Judaism. So let me give you a couple of uh, examples is um, the concept that a Jew is one who is born to a Jewish mother or properly converted. Well, if you just sit down and read the very first chapter of the book of Numbers, you'll see it that it's through the father, through the father, through the father, through the father. I mean, it tells it to you like a dozen times. <clears throat> and so that's one of those ideas that is not necessarily biblical. I mean, sure, if you're born to a Jewish mother, you're Jewish, but also if you're born to a Jewish father, that's just obvious. I mean, that's just logic and genetics, right? It's, right. it's logical and it's biological. Right. right. <laughs> but to say that if you're born to a Jewish father and a Gentile mother, then you're not Jewish, that's just nonsensical. And But that's a rabbinic Jewish thing. See what I mean? Right. So both parents have to be Jewish. To have a right. Jewish family. Or, or this thing about how you can't eat any kind of meat with any kind of dairy. And I know when I, I attended private Jewish school, if we were having meat for lunch, they would unplug the candy machine because that way we couldn't get milk chocolate. Interesting. Right. Well, that's right. a rabbinic Jewish thing. The Bible says <clears throat> nothing about that. Interesting. It, it, it says, do not boil a kid in its mother's milk. So that's it. It's very specific. It's right. do not method of cooking, boil, type of animal, kid, relationship, it's mothers, and substance, milk. Right. That somehow becomes, you can't ever eat any kind of dairy with any kind of meat whatsoever. And that, that, I mean? that, right, that practice is pretty much universal among all strains of Judaism now, right? It's not oh, yeah, right, definitely, so. right. definitely. And so, 
another way that Judaism is very similar to Catholicism is the blanket claim that we have always believed whatever, fill in the blank. Right. We have always believed this, always believed this, always believed it. And what you end up finding when you do your research is that is not actually the case. And so you run into a ton of that when you are reading what are known as counter-missionaries or anti-missionaries who are Jews who specifically try to act against Christianity. Um, they will claim that they've always believed things they have most certainly not always believed and they will uh, selectively pick and choose oh well the Messiah is supposed to do this and this and this and Jesus didn't therefore he doesn't count um, bypassing a lot of other things he was supposed to do such as suffer and die so that's why when I was going through the, this research and just finding it unbelievable how um, why, why is it that I'm not aware of this and why am I finding that people who talk about this are so selective and restrictive? Um, I ended up putting it all in writing. Gotcha. I, I'm, I'm a fan of these uh, Messianic Jewish testimonies that Jews who've become Messianic Jews give. R right. And one of the, one of the statements one of these guys said that resonated with me is that Jesus is the best kept Jewish secret secret. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, maybe I should define that too. Okay. So, um, sometimes I'll, I'll call myself a Messianic Jew and I can tell people don't really understand what that means. So then I'll say something like, well, I'm a Jewish Christian because at least that's right. two words that they recognize. Right. So a Messianic Jew could attend a messianic synagogue or they could attend just a regular Christian church. Um, they, they might keep some of the Jewish laws, seeing them as already having been fulfilled. But for instance, if you go to a messianic Jewish Passover, you understand that it's not cleansing you of your sins. You just recognize that it's uh, symbolic of what Jesus did. Now, you do have other groups. Again, all these labels, look, they're kind of general. So it's not like they're – no label on anybody is very neat. But you have other groups who call themselves Hebrew roots. And that can be a bit different. That tends to be the group that claims that you must keep the law, you know, the Old Testament law of Moses, the Tanakh, or the Torah, I should say and that uh, Gentiles might also need to be doing that as well. So that's another set of definitions. Right. So what happens is <clears throat> the rabbinate, right? Just like in Catholicism, you have the bishopric, a system of bishops. In right. Judaism, you have the rabbinate, the system of rabbis. They end up claiming, well, you know, when Moses was up on Sinai, God gave him law that he was supposed to write down, yes, but he also gave him oral law that he was not supposed to write down, but was supposed to pass down his oral tradition. And so that is a lowercase Gnostic claim, which is we have this secret tradition that was passed down orally and was not written down. Okay. Interesting. So that ends up being written down in the uh, about second century AD. Um, and that's called the, well, let me actually, let me back up one step. Okay. So when I ran across all this rabbinic literature that seemed very familiar as far as a Messiah being like Jesus is, I was lecturing on this once and somebody asked me, well, but was that stuff written before Jesus or after Jesus time and I said the overwhelming majority of everything that we have from rabbinic Judaism comes from after the time of Jesus so that it comes from after the time of Jesus and it's so agreeable to a Messiah like he was is even stronger evidence that uh, because it's being written by people who have a dog in the fight right they right. have a God they have a God in the fight and so the fact that they're having to uh, come to these conclusions and admit these things, even after the time of Jesus, is even stronger evidence 
that the scriptures are speaking of a, of a Messiah that is like Jesus. So what we have from before the time of Jesus, and we're not just talking about translations of the Bible like the Septuagint. Uh, I mean, rabbinic literature, you could say that the Targumim are those, uh, the Targums. These are not, the reason they're considered rabbinic literature is because they're not strict translations of the Tanakh. Mm -hmm. They're they're paraphrases. And, and I say Targumim because that's a plural and there's more than one. So some are pretty strict and some are extremely loose. So for instance, you have uh, Targum Ankelos, but even that's from the second century AD, and it's pretty strict in terms of being a uh, paraphrasic translation, let's say, of the Hebrew into Aramaic. That's what the Targums imply, is that it's Aramaic. And then you go as late as the 600s AD for the Palestinian Targum, aka the Targum of Jonathan ben Uziel, a.k.a. the Targum Pseudo-Jonathan, which is extremely, I mean, it's saturated with rabbinic folklore. It's really just, you can barely call it a translation anymore. But now, as far as the oral law I mentioned, that ends up being called the Mishnah. Gotcha. Mishnah. And, okay, so around 200 A.D., the Mishnah ends up getting written down. And then, rabbis start writing commentaries about the Mishnah, and that's called the Gemara. Okay, so at this point, they have the Tanakh, they have the Old Testament, and then they're writing down the Mishnah, which they claim is as authoritative as the written Tanakh is, this oral tradition. So when they write it down, it's as authoritative as the written Tanakh. So they said. Then they comment on it, right. Yeah. Okay. Then they comment on it. That's the Gemara. Well, from roughly 400 to 600 AD, those get compiled. And when those are published, that's called the Talmudim. Okay, so right. you can tell I'm using the plural again because there's two Talmudim. Right, because people have heard of Talmud. They usually heard that referenced, right? But not the yeah, Talmudim, and, right? No, and it's understandable because the... The Talmud Yerushalmi, or the Jerusalem Talmud, is not as extensive and it's not as authoritative. Whereas the Talmud Bavli, or the Babylonian Talmud, that's about the size of, I don't know, maybe 10 regular Bibles. It's a tremendous work and it's a, a lot more authoritative. So that, that's why generally when you hear about the Talmud, it, it's almost guaranteed that it'll be a reference to the Babylonian one. Gotcha. And then you have uh, Midrashim, okay? Uh, a lot of times when people are talking about interpretations, you hear that it's uh, Midrashic trans uh, interpretation or Midrash. That, that's what it it's referring to is various texts written around f from 400 to 1200 AD. And these are more like um, homilies and sermons. So they contain commentary on the Tanakh, but they're also uh, very speculative and folkloric as well. Gotcha. And so this is really, there, there's, and then through the years, individual rabbis have written all kinds of things because, uh, you know, Jews became very studious. I mean, it was essentially considered a sin to not be literate because then you couldn't study God's word. But th this is the bulk of the rabbinic literature. It's a vast corpus of oh, absolutely that stuff. Are you able to read that in that in that version of Hebrew, or uh, is it dated? Is it too dated? The modern Hebrew is no, it, no. comparable to the what's been written. Well, back? I mean, all of these have, have been published in modern it's Hebrew. Modern Everything's Bible. been updated. Okay, but. I didn't know that. So this is the bulk of it. And so these are the texts that I was looking at, uh, prompted by a book by two Gentiles, <laughs> two Goyim, who said, hey, look, look at the, ba the, the backing we have from rabbinic Judaism's very own literature about 
the kind of Messiah that we're to expect. Gotcha. So they they took a different approach. Instead of trying to prove Christ from the Old Testament, they they went through the rabbinic works. In a manner of speaking, yes. What the, what they would also do, and what a lot of uh, Messianic Jewish and Gentile scholars have done, is to also argue from the Old Testament, but backing it up by showing, hey, this isn't just our interpretation that we invented. This has been in rabbinic Judaism's own literature for centuries. Interesting. So what was the title of that book again? The so Search for Messiah. Search for Messiah, gotcha. So that was really where it started for you. In terms of the scholarship, yes. Gotcha. And what uh, what type of references within this vast corpus of rabbinic Judaism look back to the time of Christ? Well, I mean, in terms of... Um, Okay, let me put, let me put it this way. Too, too so you read through the, what's that? That's too, it's, it's, it requires too long a response. <laughs> well, it's too much. I mean, you have your book, just, book is 374 pages. So. Right. And, and it's like you said, we have to define our terms and it's so challenging to contextualize everything, especially if we're speaking to people who don't really have a background in this, everything can just seem really esoteric. Yeah, so to put it, to put it simply, yeah. Well, why don't we just skip that question is moving too far ahead. And why don't you explain kind of the, the prefatory information, which is who is a Jew? What's the definition of a Jew? Well, that, that again, it depends on who you ask. Are you asking rabbinic Judaism or are, are you asking Modern Israel, right. right? Are you asking uh, logic? Are you asking genetics? <laughs> right. I don't know. Sure. That's a good question. Right. I've never actually begged that. You know, that question hasn't been begged to me. Like I've always considered Jews both uh, genetics and a religion. I think it's actually kind of a, a misnomer to apply one word to two different two different meaning. Like you can be Jewish, which you have to unpack that, right? Right. It's just like the word Israelite. Well, I can say I'm an Israelite because I'm Jewish, but I'm not an Israelite because I'm not a citizen of the modern nation of Israel. Right? Right, right. <laughs> and um, so, sorry. if you read the first chapter of the book of Numbers, just as one example, you'll see about a dozen times where it's telling you that the genealogy is being reckoned through the Father. Right. Even Christ, Christ's okay, genealogy and then, is through the Father as well, right? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say that if you read the whole Tanakh, I mean, obviously, if you're born of a Jewish father or a Jewish mother, either one or both, you're a Jew. I mean, it's because, again, it's it's the level of genetics, right? Gotcha. Whether you carry, wh whether you live a lifestyle that lives the theology might be a different issue, but who can be identified as a Jew uh, that's the issues you get into, and that's why I had a. It took me a whole chapter to, to lay this out in the book. Is okay. My genetics can show you that I'm part of the Jewish people group, but my beliefs will tell you whether I'm theologically part of that people group or not. But so rabbinic Judaism says if you're born of a Jewish mother or properly converted then you're Jewish. So the problem is that if you're born of a Jewish father but not a Jewish mother, then they don't consider you genetically Jewish, which just good old-fashioned doesn't make sense. I mean, I, I understand that there are reasons that they came to the, that ruling. Uh, for instance, when I attended private Jewish school, I still remember that uh, Mr. Mintz, it was, Mr. Mintz said, well, they did that because you might not always know who the father is, but you would always know who the mother is. Huh. And so I could see maybe there were logical reasons for that, but the problem is there are, I, I don't even know how many people in the world today who are being told that they're not Jewish genetically, even though their genetics are Jewish, uh, just because they were born to a Jewish father, and, but not a Jewish mother. So it really does create a problem. Gotcha. 
So then you have the issue of people who say, okay, look, genetics, schematics, okay, it's, it's, it's one thing if you're genetically Jewish, but can you still be Jewish theologically if you believe J Jesus is the Messiah? And one thing that I do in the book is to give you examples of how, hey, if you're an atheist, that's fine, you're still Jewish. If you're an agnostic, that's fine, you're still Jewish. If you're a liberal Jew who basically denies almost everything in the Tanakh, that's fine. Uh, if you're a Reconstructionist, that's fine. But hey, oh what? You believe Jesus is the Messiah? Well, there you go. Then you, you're no longer Jewish. And the way that I put it to my own dad when he asked me, Vat, you going to convert now? Um, <laughs> actually, he, he didn't say that. Uh, he actually said, ¿Qué te vas a convertir? So, yeah, he asked me if I'm going to convert because I was talking to him about this stuff. Are you going to convert to Christianity? And I said, there's nothing for me to convert to. I mean, I'm a Jew who believes the Jewish Messiah came in the person of the Jewish man, Jesus, as prophesied in the Jewish scriptures. And so how exactly am I converting into something different? <laughs> yeah, good point. Well said. Yeah. Stated as the king of the Jews, right? On the point of the right, right. right. I mean, I don't think Pontius Pilate put that up as mo as a mockery at all. I actually think that, in my opinion, my my opinion, he put that up uh, with a very educated knowledge of who Christ was. That's my opinion. Interesting. Yeah. So, so you, uh, you, that you go through and you talk about kind of this definition of of Jewish and. You talk about kind of the Jewish response to to the kind of Christian view, like what, uh, like you know, what this kind of you'd say Epstein's logic fallacy, and you, you talk about Jews in the New Testament, right? Because that's one of the areas in in which. Jews tell you that we've always believed this thing and we only believe this one thing and that's all there is to it when it's not. So in that case, it was someone who had written a book and part of it was about who is a Jew and who isn't. And I actually had a chance to correspond with him. And I mean, he was talking about stuff like um, modern day Israeli courts and what they had decided. And I was saying, look, I'm, that's a different issue. I'm talking about who is a Jew or a Hebrew, an Israelite, in God's sight, not in a modern-day uh, secular national Israeli government court. You know what I mean? <laughs> and so this, these are some of the things that I was pointing out to him, is that uh, it's very obvious from rabbinic Judaism's very own laws and a lot of... Jewish dictionaries and encyclopedias that you can find, they're very open about the fact that, look, if you're born Jewish, you're always Jewish. Um, because there's that aspect of it that you can't change your genetics. But then there's the aspect of it of, well, how far does your theology need to change before they consider you no longer Jewish? Gotcha. Um, so... When, when you progress through the book, you kind of, uh, you de describe whether a Jew had to keep the 613 commandments. Can you talk about that? Sure. It's very commonly stated to Jews, well, do you keep the 613 commandments? And the issue is no individual Jew ever had to do that, simply because some of those commandments were just for males and some just for females and some just for kings and some just for priests. And so it ends up reducing the number of commandments any one individual Jew had to keep. Gotcha. That's just a fact. And the Talmud talks about how uh, through one prophet after another, one Jewish leader after another, what happened is what they call that the commandments were reduced and they ended up being reduced into one single commandment, which is the just shall live by faith. And not coincidentally, that's exactly what Paul the Apostle, a.k.a. Rabbi Saul of Tarsus, ends up saying in the New Testament. Yeah, fascinating. So that brings us to the issue of, well, 
Jesus came and basically says, hey, I fulfilled the law and now I'm bringing in this new covenant. And that's just goes against the entire Tanakh. That's simply unknown that that was supposed to happen. But again, that's one of those things you end up finding in rabbinic literature. No, they're extremely well, well aware that when the Messiah comes, he'll fulfill the commandments and he'll have a new law. He'll have a new covenant. That's it's just clear as day. It's very well known to those who know. <laughs> so, so this is uh, through all of these oral laws and through the Talmudim that's mentioned. Is that there is a new covenant? Absolutely, that that there's going to be a fulfillment and that there's going to be an establishment of a new. Call it what you will. Uh, some use the term a new Torah. Some use the term new covenant. Either way. It's just like the book of Hebrews explains in the New Testament. Look, with a new priesthood comes a new covenant. Just like there's a Noahide covenant that was essentially worldwide. Then there was, there's the Aaronic priesthood, Levitical priesthood, right? They, it, things change as they progress when the new one comes in. So the Messiah being, as the Psalms say, a priest in the order of Melchizedek, well, that's a different priesthood. So therefore, it necessitates a different Torah or a different uh, covenant. Let's see. Um, and uh, what what else did, you know, in these, you know, other than like the, whether the commandments are kept, like what, how does that, doesn't that apply to, like you were talking about the Hebrew roots? Is that this new government, a negation of this kind of movement towards going back to the Old Testament? Well, yes, the Hebrew roots would tell you that you have to live by the commandments. Now, let me say that anybody who claims that, Jew or Gentile, they will by necessity be extremely selective as to which of the commandments do you actually have to still keep? Because obviously there's no temple. <laughs> right. So just the fact that there's no temple means that you cannot keep many of the commandments, period. You can't do it. Just point blank. You can't do it. And so, oh, well, you know, you have to keep the commandments, but you actually can't do this one and this one and this one and this one. So, you know, this idea of you still have to live by the commandments ends up mm, not really living by the commandments just for the simple fact of reality that you can't really do that. Now, when I talk about, again, let me just reiterate. Okay. When we're talking about groups that claim you have to keep the commandments, I'm talking about the ones who claim that you have to keep the commandments in order to be saved, right? Not the ones that say, hey, if you're a Messianic Jew or a Gentile and you attend the Passover service, because you recognize that it's symbolic of Christ's completed atonement, that's one issue. If you're attending it because you think it's going to save you, that's a whole other story. Gotcha. Um, so uh, th what's interesting, too, when you kind of go through this, your kind of intro on your book is how much, how similar the post-Christ rav ravenate states things that explain or are very similar to interpretations of Christ as Messiah. Right. You know, I think that that's pretty, that was a fascinating aspect of your book. Absolutely. That's, that's why I emphasize that most of this rabbinic literature, I mean, the overwhelming majority of it is after the time of Jesus. So it's even more impactful that they're coming to such agreement with the quote-unquote Christian conclusions about these things. And so one of the main things to think about is, as you read through the Tanakh, um, and as far as we're de defining terms, I might as well define that one. Okay. So Jew Jews love acrostics, okay? <laughs> and Tanakh is an acrostic referring to the three traditional divisions of the Old Testament, right? Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketubim. And so, Tanakh, Tanakh ends up just being pronounced as Tanakh. So that just refers to the whole Old Testament. Gotcha. So as you read through it, you'll start recognizing that there's two, what are generally termed lines 
of messianic prophecy because you read, oh, okay, the Messiah is going to be a conquering king who defeats Israel's enemies outright and he's going to rule the world. Uh, but then you go, oh, wait a minute, the Messiah is going to be a suffering servant who dies. Okay, so wait a minute. <laughs> What, what's actually going to happen? What kind of Messiah should we really expect? Right. Be because there is that uh, tension, as it were. There are those two options. And so, again, modern day rabbinic Jews will tell you that they've always believed that the Messiah is going to come and instantly defeat Israel's enemies. And he'll establish what's known as the world to come and there'll, there'll be peace and all of this, right? But that's not, <laughs> that's not what the rabbinic literature says at all. Um, not what's so, not close. even close because they did have to grapple with those options and those options are diametrically opposed. And so there were concepts about how, well, maybe there was be two messiahs, right? One of them would come and he would be, su he would be a suffering messiah who would die, be killed. And then uh, later a second messiah would come and he would be the conqueror. Or maybe it was one messiah that would come twice. You do find that in the rabbinic literature. Well, that's basically so you can Chris see how that's Christian eschatology right there, right? Exactly, yeah. <clears throat> exactly. So that's my point, again, in the subtitle of Judaism versus Judaism debate. If you want to argue about that, you need to argue amongst yourselves first. You need to deal with your own literature before you start telling Christians that uh, they have a faulty messianic concept because that exists in your own literature. So deal with that first. Yeah, amazing. That's amazing. Right? In-house. And then take it out to, to others. And another extremely significant thing is I also have an entire chapter talking about reinterpretations of the Tanakh. Right, where I'm not talking about um, the text of the Old Testament being corrupted. I'm just talking about um, how they would change the interpretations just to make it appear as if the Christians were wrong about any right anything that they, they might have been referring to. Yeah, I think you used a couple of examples in there. I think it was uh, Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. I think you have a chapter of the Psalm 22 controversy, but don't they reinterpret that as not applying to Christ, right? Is that correct? Yes, I'm, in fact, yes. Okay. I'm trying to look up. Okay, here's a perfect example. Uh, this is from a book written by a Jewish scholar, and he's talking about Rashi, okay, another acrostic, okay. <laughs> Rashi is one of the most well-known and respected rabbis in all history, and Rashi stands for Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzaki, or Rabbi Solomon, son of Isaac, okay. okay. And so, this Jewish scholar, uh, Maurice Liber, he writes this, okay, this is very indicative of what we're talking about right now. Okay. The church, it is well known, transformed chiefly the Psalms into predictions of Christianity. In order to ward off such an interpretation and not expose themselves to criticism, many Jewish exegetes gave up that explanation of the Psalms by which they are held to be proclamations of the Messianic era and would see in them allusions only to historical facts. Rashi followed this tendency. For instance, he formally states, and now quoting Rashi, our masters applied the passage to the Messiah, but in order to refute the minim, it is better to apply it to David. So let me just back up a little bit. And um, so he refers to Jewish exegetes, obviously from exegesis, meaning the interpreters. Mm -hmm. And the word minim, it means sectarian. So it was often a way to refer to Christians. Gotcha. So he's, he's saying that the Jewish interpreters changed their interpretation of the Psalms to not expose themselves to criticism, 
So in other words, they, they, they saw that Christianity was appealing to them. And it was already in the rabbinic literature that all these Psalms were about the Messiah. But they decide, no, we're going to change that. We're going to claim that it's just about something different. And uh, Rashi ends up saying, our masters apply this passage to the Messiah. They know it. In this case, he was talking about Psalm 21, by the way. Gotcha. Okay. So we know that. Th this is our history and our literature. We understand that. But... In order to refute the Christians, it is better to apply it to David. So you see, the psalm still reads the same way it does, and the ancient rabbinic literature still reads the, the way it was. But Rashi, who was around, I think, in the 12th century, 11th century, he says, no, 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 no. Let's apply it to David just so we can say the Christians are wrong. Yeah, that's amazing. And honestly, honestly, that was... a. Uh, that was a, ch a tough chapter because I have an entire chapter of examples like that. And that was a tough chapter to have to, to write and look at and put in print. Because so there's so many examples of the rabbinate, rabbinate making those decisions or reinterpretations, not just. Right. Right. Just the one country. And so that's, that's the issue I, I'm looping back to is that's why now you end up with modern day rabbinic Jews saying, no, no, we have always believed that, as in this example, Psalm 21 is only about David. We've always believed that. that no, no, no. <laughs> that is simply not the case. Interesting. So, yeah, it's interesting how those dates, the dates of that reinterpretation changed. When did, when did those reinterpretations, I guess it's post-Christ sometime right there at the beginning. What was it? Uh, when was it? Jerusalem was what? Sacked in 70 AD. And then Bar Kokhba right. was 130 AD. Is that right? I think the, so it's well, the, the th uh, my point is just that they supposed like all of the, it's right there where the church itself is growing, you know, that maybe these reinterpretations were very, I'm curious as to whether those reinterpretations were very close to really the advent of, of Christianity. Well, like I said, I have a whole chapter of examples. The one I just gave is from like the 11th or 12th century AD. So, yeah. You know, even over one millennia after the fact, they're still dealing with this stuff. They're still recognizing that their own literature agrees with Christian interpretations, and they're trying to hide it by changing it. It's just a, it's it's a painful fact, but it is a fact. Well, we're at forty-two minutes. I've got about five more minutes. Do you want to cover anything? I think that we I think that. Yeah, the audience deserves an hour too. I feel like we haven't covered even half of the book. I mean, if you want to. Oh yeah, it it's uh, yeah. We should definitely do a second hour. Okay. What do you want to kind of close this this first uh, episode with? Well, how about that? In rabbinic literature, it was very well known that we could expect a suffering. Messiah who gets killed. That is very plain and simple. Even in the Talmud itself, it talks about the leper Messiah. And I know some of you younger kids think that that was just a Metallica song, or right. <laughs> or actually David da David Bowie. Uh, David Bowie also had a lyric uh, like a leper Messiah. And I mean, I don't know if Metallica and David Bowie were reading the Talmud, but it's in there. Uh, and it talks about how the Messiah is a leper, and while the other lepers unwrap all of their wrappings on their wounds t all together and then replace them all, the leper Messiah changes one wrapping at a time because he's expecting that at any moment he's going to be called by God to fulfill his role as the Messiah, right? Because... Um, so in, in other words, he's, he's a suffering uh, Messiah who's a leper and he's just there waiting, just waiting for God to say, okay, do your job, you know, fulfill your mission. And that, uh, there's all kinds of examples like that uh, in rabbinic literature. So in other words, a, a Messiah that is like Jesus who comes and preaches and suffers and is killed and then is expected to return again that is absolutely within the realm of good old-fashioned uh, rabbinic judaism the, the, there's no way that it can be 
be denied legitimately. And do you do you think that that rabbinic Judaism that's taught in certain synagogues or temple is still being taught today? That this this oh absolutely okay. gotcha. oh that that is standard that is normative. There's no question about it. I mean, if you attend a yeshiva, right? That's like a specific institute that teaches rabbinic Judaism. Most of the learning comes out of the Talmud. That's what you're studying mostly. Gotcha. And because because why not? The, the Talmud tells you what to think about the Tanakh, right? Right. It's another thing that's very similar to Catholicism. Why would you as a Catholic read the Bible when the priest and the bishopric and the pope are there to interpret it for you through the catechism? So right. you need to read the catechism. Right. Now, I'll grant you, it's not like the, the catechism, it's not a commentary on the Old Test, uh, on the Bible, and uh, neither is the Talmud strictly a commentary on the Tanakh, but the catechism and the Talmud, the Talmudim, those are what's, what are telling you what it means to be a Jew, what it means to be a Catholic, right. and how you should think about your theology and how you should think about your scriptures. No doubt. So At those become for, as... A, right. No, you're right. Continue, please. I'm sorry. They become as authoritative, right? They become as authoritative as the written word of God. Well, I because would because you're in yeah. those systems, right? Absolutely. Well, my my growing up in Catholicism, we rarely, if ever, read took out the Bible and read it. Maybe a passage here and there, but the majority of references in church were this other, you know, book that probably is the Catechism and all these other right. things. So you would never know. A lot of the stuff that's around you is not biblical from the way that you approached scripture. You know, it, there was definitely some kind of window you were seeing through. Because the point is authority, right? Why would you, again, as a Catholic, pick up the Bible and read it when it's, it's not for you? It's for the priesthood. And so picking up the Bible and reading it as a Catholic is just causing trouble because you're going to start asking those kinds of questions right. and they're going to tell you you're not coming to the right answers because we are the infallible interpreters of the scriptures. So your job is to learn what we tell you. Does the rabbinate, it's just, it's, does, yeah, does the modern rabbis, do they have that, that pretense to infallibility that the Catholics have? Well, I, I should say that Okay, so let's let, let's say look around the world at Judaism today, and I sh I hope that it would be granted that again you're you're talking about various different groups, right? right? You have extremely liberal Jews that you would barely recognize theologically as Jews, and you have extremely Orthodox Jews. So you have all kinds, right. but yeah, in the conservative and the in the Orthodox. Um, Groups, absolutely. The, the rabbi is basically your ultimate conduit wow. to understanding God's will. Fascinating. And incidentally, let me throw this in. Um, so just like the rabbinic Jews, the rabbinate claimed that when Moses was up on Sinai, he got not only the law to write down, but also uh, oral traditions, oral laws. Uh, then much later in history, the Kabbalists came along, right, the Jewish mystics, mm -hmm. and they decided to also claim that, well, guess what? When Moses was up on Sinai, God also gave him a series of mystical teachings that he was also supposed to pass down orally, wow. and that becomes the Kabbalistic writings. Now, I tell you, you know, Moses yeah. was up there. He's, he's getting the law he's supposed to write down. He's